inside behavioral health and today we are going to be speaking about some a topic that is so close to my heart it is called dealing with anxiety and intrusive thoughts during a time of isolation um, and I am with one of I, I honestly Lara one of my favorite people oh. ever this is Lara Eflin she's a licensed clinical social worker yeah. And she is the uh, clinical director for our Western region for Eating Recovery mm-hmm. Centre and Insight mm-hmm. Behavioural Health. Say that yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five times. Right? <laughs> now, honestly, um, I just, I just want to uh, give you a heartfelt um, introduction because um, the first time... Well, one of the first times that I met you was when I was struggling. I'd met you at conferences before, but mm-hmm. I remember I was struggling so profoundly about a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd been in recovery from an eating disorder for over 18 years. And I was struggling um, for quite some time. And um, I called you up. I got enough courage to call you up because I heard that you were this pretty fancy clinician. <laughs> and so I called you up and I said, I-, I feel really ashamed. I'm having these intrusive thoughts. I don't know what to do. And you said to me, you know, Robin, you're having a flare up and you've got to be really gentle with yourself. Mm-hmm. And that was really interesting to me because, first of all, I'd never heard anyone mention that a flare up was um, associated with mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I thought about my mom when she had lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and she would mm-hmm. say, oh, I'm having a flare-up, when, you know, in the winter seasons and stuff like that, but yeah. never mental illness. So it really changed, even as a mental health advocate, it really changed my viewpoint um, about flare-ups. You know, my mom, when she was sick, she took care of herself. She took her time out. She rested as much as she needed. She looked after herself with nutrition Mm -hmm. and light exercise and she meditated. She did whatever she needed to. And I think that that's really important in this time for us to remember that mental health deserves that kind of respect too because it is actual, in fact, health. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. So I just want to take one moment to have a look over here. It's the first time I've ever seen this. It says, join me live on this link. Okay. And I'm not sure. So I can't see. Let me see. I can't see. Usually I can see people on this, but I can't see this right now. So I'm just going to leave that and act as if people are coming in. If you're coming in and you've just you've just started um, watching us. I am Robin Cruz and I'm here with the wonderful Lara Ethland and we are talking about dealing with anxiety and intrusive thoughts during isolation. So my first question to you, yeah. Ms. Lara, mm-hmm. is what are some of the ways we can support ourselves when we're dealing with a flare-up of anxiety or if we're dealing with the fear of a flare-up? With anxiety. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of the conversations that I'm having with people right now is first and foremost to be incredibly compassionate with yourself right now. Um, so this is this is kind of a surprise, right? right. Nobody was planning this. No one was expecting for us to feel um, yeah. everything that's kind of coming at us because it's so unfamiliar to be mm-hmm. in this in this particular right. really historic moment in life. Mm-hmm. So when this happens, flare-ups actually occur. So flare-ups are, you know, just technically for those that are just kind of one, I think you did a beautiful job of explaining it, is essentially like you feel as though you're managing, you're, mm-hmm. you have high level of competence of skill, mm-hmm. um, you've done all the wonderful work and life kind of throws you Uh, off kilter right Mm -hmm. so it's either something happens that you weren't expecting Mm -hmm. or it could be seasonal I mean it can be as as simple as the weather changing it can also be um, a memory so something occurs an anniversary of some sort so 
what happens with that is we are taken off guard, right? Because right. we feel as though we're in, we're incredibly competent. We can handle so many so many things coming our way. We've been doing so well, and something like this, you know, when working in kind of a community based widespread um, epidemic, mm -hmm. right. this is a huge flare up. This yes. is something that can occur that we were not anticipating, and we we don't we don't know how to respond to. So. Giving yourself that space and compassion that mm -hmm. your brain is mm -hmm. automatically going to maybe even go to the time in which it was the hardest for you, right. which is why it's like a flare up. Right. So imagine, you know, maybe for some of you might be experiencing almost like a bottom like experience right. where it just really feels as though it's um, knocked you off your feet. For others, it might just feel like this, this slow kind of um, reduction in capacity or you're just feeling more depressed or more anxious. Mm -hmm. um, or you can't sleep. Sleep cycles are typically mm -hmm. the most commonly disrupted during this time. Yeah. So because our minds are in this flare up, what tends to happen is we are trying to overcompensate for that by beating ourselves up. Mm -hmm. And being like, I know how to handle this. What's wrong with me? Why can't I get through this? And what you really want to do is pull way back and mm -hmm. remind yourself that actually, I've never been in this scenario before. Right. I have a lot of skills, but I need to learn how to translate it to today's situation. So it's going to take some time to figure yeah. that out. Yeah, that is that is awesome that you said that. I, you know, what I really liked what you said about, you know, yes, we are in a pandemic, and yes, it's going to be common that we have these flare ups, and they can happen when there is less of this kind of issue. They can oh, happen yeah. if, if it's change season. It can happen if you haven't slept enough. It can happen, you know, anniversary of a, a death or something mm -hmm. that triggers you. So I really love that you put that in perspective. Just um, before we go on with our next question, for those of you who have entered, um, I am Robin Cruz and this is Lara Eflin and we're speaking about dealing with anxiety and intrusive thoughts uh, during our isolation. I just want to say hello to a couple of people that have come in and said hi. Sarah, hello. Uh, Rosa, hello. And Elise, uh, Christine, hello. Welcome. Hello. Um, there are some questions here, Lara, and I just want to let you guys know that I will absolutely get to these. If for some reason we run out of time, um, I will make sure that I get with Lara and get the answers to your questions, but I am going to try to um, answer those in a little bit. Well, I'm not, Lara is. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so a big question here. Um, you know, I know for myself, triggers are happening, right? Mm -hmm. Flare ups are happening, they're in full force. And as you said, I have tools, but sometimes mm -hmm. my mind is just you know, work harder, Robin, just do this, get, get everything certain, do, you know, and that's, so what do, what do we do when we are feeling triggered um, or we feel like we're going into a spiral? So the, the best thing to try to do is to bring back that skill of awareness and to really try to take that step back and recognize this, the experience that I'm having mm -hmm. is due to the spiral. Right. It is due to the fact that I have, you know, whether it's been a while or it's been ongoing, I do struggle with anxiety. I do struggle with depression. I do have, you know, I am recovering from an eating disorder. Either way, we're always, recovery is everlasting, right? Mm -hmm. So to remind ourselves of that and which means, okay, so in this situation, I may have the tendency to respond in this way. Mm -hmm. So it's almost kind of going back to that, zooming out, seeing the big picture, because right. what happens with anxiety, depression, or those triggering you know, thoughts and emotions with you know, having an eating disorder is that you actually zoom way in. Everything becomes mm -hmm. incredibly microscopic. Right. So yeah. first and foremost, finding that awareness again of getting your bearings, looking around you, you know, kind of orienting yourself to the landscape of what is happening internally 
and then what's happening externally. Okay, so, sorry, go on. No. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was thinking. So, so you're saying that if I'm in a trigger, I can say what's going on around me, and do I do I look at my senses? Am I saying I like I'm looking in my environment, and then I'm am I noticing my body? Am I noticing my breathing? Mm -hmm. Well, all the above, actually. Okay. What just happened? What right. what actually caused this trigger to occur? how am I feeling? Identifying emotions is actually incredibly grounding. I am feeling sad. I am, it's not just anxiety. I'm also, right. you know, it's not just fear. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling sad for the loss of, you know, the things that were, why isn't mm -hmm. it, you know, why isn't it that right. way? Um, right. Looking at all the components that are making up this, this emotion, this, mm -hmm. or this feeling sense that you're having. Right. And then, but then zooming out and looking at, you know, it's, it is the senses, it's the here and the now, but then it's also right. looking at the bigger picture of what exactly is happening in this moment that caused that trigger and what's, it's, I'm already in a vulnerable place. Right. This is a vulnerable situation. Right. That in itself is triggering. Is that helpful? Yeah, no, it, absolutely helpful. I want to just read some of these comments to see if you yeah. can help. Uh, Lara, uh, Sarah says, I'm struggling with stores not having my safe preferred foods. That's causing a lot of anxiety for me and probably has contributed to my reemergence of old ed behaviors. What do we do when the tools we would usually use, eating with friends, face to face contact with friends, going to therapy, seeing our dietitians, is not available to us because of the lockdown? I'm in a state under lockdown. Thank you, yeah. Sarah. No, absolutely, Sarah. I think you're hitting it right where a lot of us are are kind of talking right now. And you're not alone. A lot of individuals, you know, so I think the first thing that you're kind of speaking to is what I was talking about before, which is you you have your tool set. You know what to do when things are getting more challenging for you. And this situation that we're in has actually changed the, you know, the course. Right. You no longer have access to those tools in the same way. Mm -hmm. So it actually, and like we all know, transitions are incredibly hard in recovery yeah. because we get very used to, you know, the safety and the comfort of the, the, the tools and the ways in which we're coping. And so then when we have to transition to something new, it, it does throw us off. And sometimes we actually feel a little worse right. before we can get back on track. So in this time, you know, I think, Sarah, you actually named some really good things. Trying to find new ways to connect with your therapist, finding new ways to connect with your friends, mm -hmm. to have more accountability during meals that you're not only eating alone all the time. And so maybe trying to find some ways to do that, um, whether it, at, you know, be joining a virtual program where they do, do you know, meal groups and support each other. Um, we're having meal, you know, I know a lot of people right now who are actually scheduling, you know, kind of friend um, hangouts and everybody's eating together mm -hmm. and everybody's, you know, playing games together or finding a new way during this time, recognizing it's not going to last forever. However, your recovery, your health, your mental health is the priority. It's number one. Mm -hmm. And so how do I, how do I adjust? And this honestly you know, I just remind myself over and over again, because I'm actually a huge believer in resiliency mm -hmm. takes constant, you know, kind of um, new challenges, new shapes, new ways yeah. to build resiliency. And that's what we're doing in this situation is we are actually building more resiliency because now you get to see in this context, how do I navigate? That's, yeah. I mean, that's pretty amazing how adaptable we can become. Wow, wonderful. Thank you, Lara. I'm just going to go to Elise uh, Christine now. She says, I just came home from treatment and I'm having Ed thoughts because I don't have as much accountability. What can I do? Well, you kind of uh, address that, right? Do you want to say anything else to that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of ways to try to, you can, you know, remain accountable for yourself. You can remain, remain accountable with others. So, um, I actually, I don't know if anybody's ever used like DBT diary cards or, 
there's other, there's apps, there's, reco- you know, there's records, there's ways to kind of remain connected to yourself, oh, yeah. to others around you to remain accountable. Um, you can actually build more of a web of a, of a community and a support group to help you remain accountable. So think going back to, you know, I'm hearing this a lot, even with um, schools, right? Like think about all the schools that have gone virtually across the nation right now. And the number one thing that I keep hearing is that they come back to goals. The simplicity of building those goals and trying mm-hmm. to follow through with them. So remaining accountable to yourself, try to find an achievable goal, try to find a way to support yourself in in a way that you can see it, you can monitor it, and mm-hmm. you can achieve it. And that oh, also, that. you want to feel reinforced for the things that you're remaining accountable for. Yeah. Um, and to be kind to yourself, because remember, in this situation, it's shifting. And so what you were uh, capable of accomplishing last week or even a month ago, it's different today. Every day is different. So kind of being kind to yourself, reminding yourself of that, and just continuing to kind of change things to, to meet the accommodation rather than the all or nothing. I love that. I love that. We have uh, two more questions, actually. They're both named Melissa. I'm going to give you the first one. I'm struggling because I'm working even more as a nurse and my mm-hmm. depression has increased. So I'm busy. It's hard to eat, etc. Melissa, thank you so much for your service and what you are doing. We all very much appreciate yeah. your work. Thank oh you. Gosh. Thank you. Um, Lara, what do you have to say about that? I, I agree with, I actually, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Thank you for your service. You know, everything that you're doing. I think a lot of us are called to action during this time. So when you are a, you know, a, a technically a, an essential person, right? Mm-hmm. An essential profession, you are a responder, you are an advocate, you, you know, you're a rescuer in a lot of ways. Um, it depletes you right, in another kind of way. And so to be be thoughtful of that, you know, that that depression does not mean that there's anything wrong with you. It's actually really a normal response to crisis mm-hmm. during this time, which is a little bit of your brain and your body protecting itself um, during this time. And so to know that sometimes your energy may be lower, to give yourself extra rest, So really, it's almost like as imperative as it is to, you know, take care of others during these really critical times, it's even more imperative to take care of yourself. And because the most important person is you as the provider, right? Mm -hmm. Because you really do have such a gift um, to give others during this time. And so how to replenish, um, I, you know, we kind of talk about the love tank, you know, that you really are taking more than you're putting in right now. So how to, you know, how to recognize that and make extra effort to, it's, you know, it's not so, you know, I think sometimes as caregivers, we, we tend to also have really high expectations of our capabilities and otherwise we feel selfish. We feel mm. um, as though we're, we're, why can't we do more? Like if your job asks so much of you and then you come home and you have a, you know, family or friends or other other things in your life, you might be putting a lot of pressure on yourself to attend to all of them with equal energy. And it's just not doable in times like this. And so how to kind of ask for more help, which is very, can be very vulnerable, yeah. very hard to do and essential. So knowing how to effectively challenge yourself push yourself a little bit further to do the things that are more uncomfortable, such as taking more time for you, asking for more help, recognizing your vulnerabilities and your limitations. Mm -hmm. I hope that's helpful. She said thank you and that she appreciates very much. She said she loves her job, but it's just hard right now. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And I think it's great that she that you honor that, Melissa, that it is hard right now because that's a fact, right? Yeah. It is, it's a fact. It is. Thank it you is. again. Um, another Melissa says, any recommendations on how to not isolate when you are in shelter in order? 
My Ed lives on isolation and I keep finding myself in my room only, mainly sleeping and not eating according to my meal plan. Well, first off, congratulations for noticing that. Be the yeah. awareness, like we, you know, we were just originally talking about awareness, is the biggest hurdle. So once you're aware and you kind of recognize, okay, this set, this situation, this setup is triggering in itself. And so we were talking about when this happens, it's actually really, really common to go back to ways in which you were maybe um, behaving or relating or responding um, when you were more at your lowest. And so it's just our brain making connections, really is, is what it is. And what you're, the difference though is because you have this awareness today, you're noticing it. You're like, huh, this is very familiar. And I'm kind of getting more into this habit, which I worked so hard to change. And now I have to be really cognizant of the fact that this, this setup, this situation is making it very enticing mm. to kind of go back to those old ways of coping. Yeah. So how do I come back and what can I change up today? I'm not going to stay in my room for countless hours. I will give myself two hours in my room, an hour outside of my room. And I can yeah. go back for two hours, you know, like really thinking about it is like, how do I break up my day? Yeah. How do I give myself a little bit difference? And then the next day, if you feel like that was successful, trying something a little different, on, you know, on top of that. So yeah. you're, you're slowly, gradually adding change. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. You are, again, really trying to be compassionate towards yourself. Yeah. It's, it's not, I'm, I'm bad, I'm wrong. What's, you know, how could I let this happen? It's actually very understandable. Yeah. This is, we're in survival mode. We time. are. We, mm -hmm. we really are. You know, sometimes, Lara, I might feel like inclined not to do the things that I know that I need to do for myself. And sometimes I just remind myself to do the next best thing. And that might just be small. It might not be a yoga practice for 30 minutes. No. It might be just a walk <laughs> up yeah. and down you know, to the other side of my apartment building mm -hmm. because that's what I can do right now and that's okay. Yes. Oh, my God. And I, I love that actually is because especially those who have so they, you know, they drive themselves very, very hard, which is a beautiful quality. It helps you get a lot accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have to recognize when that does not translate well. Yeah. And it really isn't worth the cost that it puts on your mental health to push yourself beyond a, what you're comfortable with today, mm -hmm. what you're capable of today. And most of the time, especially when we are experiencing mm -hmm. mental health issues, we do want to kind of not pull back all the way because that mm -hmm. actually causes more of the same Yes. Um, but instead find a balance. Oh, I where, love that. Yeah. So it's not so much of stop, right? This is not a freeze moment, but it's mm -hmm. also not a sprint moment. And instead it's actually finding more of that comfortable. Right. Um, the gray. Kind of, it's like living gray. in the gray instead of yeah. the black or the white. Right. I love that. You know, Here's a question that I really love. Kimberly Meggs. Hello, darling. Hello. Hi, Kim. Um, she says, how do we handle or protect ourselves from absorbing the sadness of all the loss we see in the world? Mm. That's a great question. You know, and I think absolving is really hard to do. And so I actually think of mindfulness with that question. The kind of mindfulness, mindfulness philosophy is it's not as though that we can absolve it. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, we really do, you know, like in the bigger picture of things, it's the balance. It's recognizing that life is full of beauty and it's mm -hmm. also full of pain. And here's a situation in which we are experiencing pain. Yeah. And there's moments of beauty, right? Like I was just 
looking at um, my Instagram feed this morning and a friend of mine, you know, she, she took a picture of her friend with all of her kids in their car and, you know, they were social distancing, but they had dropped off fresh baked cookies, you know, to their house and they were waving to each other, you know, from the car, no one was interacting with one another, but just these moments of kindness, you know, in a time like this, we, the balance is, so the times that like when you read these articles, you are, you know, kind of getting all this information, regardless of whether you're talking to someone or you're Mm -hmm. going and you're actually reading or watching the news to try to also remind yourself of the things, well, what can I do to then build the compassion um, for yeah. someone else or to give to someone else during this time because the everyone's experiencing pain. And so right. we all need that balance. Um, and one thing I just wanted to reiterate to everybody that I do think is really, really critical right now because there's so much pain mm-hmm. in the media, there's so much that is, and and honestly, I do kind of feel like it's getting to a point where the amount, the volume of stories is kind of that critical tipping point of suffering. Yeah. yeah. Is that you you do have to look at this in you have to you have to be responsible of limiting the dosage. Yeah. So that you are not inundated with this overwhelming sense of information, of um, of pain of others, especially if you are what what we like to refer to as a super feeler. Which means oh. you have a lot. Of, <laughs> you ha- yeah, it's a superpower. You're incredibly yeah. oh. giving, right? You have so many beautiful qualities to you, and it's v- it's very hard to actually balance when you're in the presence of someone else's emotions mm-hmm. or another person um, another person's experience. It's actually really hard not to experience it a bit yourself, which is what mm-hmm. that feeling state is, is that you have this natural ability to take on other people's emotions, which is em- empathy mm-hmm. and sympathy. And But to know that about yourself does mean that it will become a kind of a weight yeah. um, and you will take it on and you will absorb it in a particular way. And so you kind of have to find your your times to replenish back to that love bank, yeah. finding times to replenish. And you know what? Sometimes I do. I don't know if this is helpful. <laughs> we'll find out, Lara, how you being the expert. <laughs> um, but sometimes I have to physically go into a quiet place and just say, I- I- I'm going to give back the energy now. I'm going to I'm going to let that go. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, I give it back because it's you know, I can't take on the whole world. And we, with those of us with anxiety, we, we often do take on a lot, you know, right, that's right. part of our, our thing. I do, um, I do want to answer one question here. And then I think um, we're going to have to uh, end it. I, if we could have at any time, I would love to do like a little breathing exercise. But this is a um, one from Sharon that I missed. I'm struggling because I'm afraid I'm going to need treatment again after all of this, and I was doing so well. Yeah, you know, and you are not alone, Sharon. No, that, that is for sure. No, no, and I think that's where to recognize that again. This is this is back to the thing that the statement that I made before about resilience. So. We are in new situations. We are being tested in new ways. And actually seeking help or needing to go back to treatment is not a failure at all. Um, If anything, what you're doing is is you're learning more about yourself. You're learning more about where you're at, what more you could work on, Mm -hmm. what more tools you would want to acquire. Um, this is this is just another shift in in context. So um, what we kind of talk about in cognitive behavioral therapy or exposure therapy, because this is one big exposure, mm-hmm. is that with each context that you feel challenged by, you're just it's actually just more information. Mm-hmm. 
And so it's not as though that you did something wrong or that you could have controlled it, or if you just would have done what have could have shoulda, that things would have been different. It actually is exactly like giving yourself that, that compassion, but then also just the reinforcement of all the things that you're doing and that you're, you're trying to do every day. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually courageous and strong to ask for help when you need it or to, to try to learn more when you know, you don't have, you know, everything figured out. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing that you could offer yourself. And so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I love that. And we we have to remember that, you know, we don't put the same judgments on those with physical illness. We wouldn't say to somebody who was struggling with cancer, I've got to go back for another treatment. Oh, my God, you've got to go back for another treatment? Right. Like you wouldn't say that. You know, recovery is messy. It's up and down and we learn new things and we put more tools in our toolkit and off Mm -hmm. we go and we do the next best thing. And sometimes we fall down and when we fall down, we just brush ourselves up and we get back up and we go on to the next best thing. Yeah. And um, I think being gentle is the biggest thing that I've uh, got from you, Lara. I mean, many, many tools. But being kind and gentle to ourselves is something that, you know, should really be first and foremost during this time. Mm-hmm. Um there are more questions, um, but we have unfortunately run out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much, Lara, for coming today. Thank I you. Know, I know you've helped so many people. And I want to say to our uh, viewers, if you are struggling, know that you are not alone. So many of us are with you in spirit. We are sending love and support. If you feel that you need um, treatment, please uh, contact Eating Recovery Center. They have many, many virtual options where you can do your treatment at home. Um, I say the biggest thing that we can do to help our community and our world at this time is to help ourselves first. Uh, We honor you and support you. And Lara, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Robin. It was wonderful to meet you all. And thank you all so much for joining us. Take care, everyone. Happy Friday. Yeah, take care.